So imagine you're walking with me in a forest. We're surrounded by the sounds of nature. You guys hear that bird out in the distance? That bird's chirping at roughly three to 5,000 hertz. We hear some cicadas coming in from the sides, roughly 2,000 hertz. You guys can hear my voice at roughly 120 to 180 hertz. Now, off in the distance, you hear the slow rumble of thunder. That low rumble is roughly 40 to 50 hertz. So let's talk about pitch. Today we're gonna to look at first the perception and the physical nature of pitch. We're gonna talk about how it's processed in our brains. And then we're gonna look at two special cases regarding pitch. The first is absolute pitch, and the second is tone deafness. So in a sense, an overactive pitch and then a pitch deficiency. So what is pitch? It's defined as the perceptual dimension of sound that orders sound from low to high frequency. Pitch is an intrinsic feature of sound, and it forms the basis of many musical effects. For example, melody is the change of pitch in time, and harmony is the overlapping concurrent layers of pitch. So pitch is our perception, but where does it begin? It starts as the frequency of a sound. The frequency is how many times a sound wave oscillates in air molecules per second. So a higher pitch means that that sound wave is oscillating faster than a lower pitch. And we use frequency to identify pitches. A modern piano is tuned with the center A at 440 hertz, so 440 times per second. Pitch is the basis of music. All human music so far discovered is based on pitch contrasts. In Western music, this forms the basis of intervals, melody, and harmony. Specific pitches have different characters. For example, the root and the fifth of a scale sound more stable than the fourth or the seventh. Musicians can use these characters to introduce and release tension in their music. Everyone knows it's important for musicians to be in tune. But to be a good musician, you also have to understand pitches and how they interact with one another. Here's a diagram of our pitch range. Human ears can hear from roughly 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. But really, the musical range stretches from about 40 hertz to 4,000 hertz. Everything above 4,000 or 5,000 hertz is high-frequency noise that doesn't really have musical character. Now, in terms of music, we consider sounds below 120 hertz around there to be low frequency, between 120 and roughly 1,000 to be middle frequency, and then above 1,000 to be high frequency. You can see on this diagram the different instruments, their different pitch ranges, as well as men's and women's voices. So on average, women's voices are an octave higher than men's voices. So how does pitch go from the quality of a sound to a perception in our brains? Well, it starts at the cochlea. Pitch begins as the frequency of sound waves that reach the outer ear. The sound goes through the middle ear and reaches the inner ear and cochlea. This is where we begin to process pitch. The hair cells along the length of the cochlea are sensitive to different levels of audio frequency. They're sensitive to high frequency along the base of the cochlea where the vibrations enter and low frequency at the apex. This is due to the relative stiffness of the fibers of the basilar membrane along the base. The hair cells are triggered by a complex pattern of frequencies and overtones and produces an electrical signal along the vestibular cochlear nerve that looks like this. Listen to this note. Now listen to this one. I played middle C for both notes. 
both notes sound like they have the same pitch, but have different characters, different timbres. In fact, the first note only contains the fundamental frequency, but the second note contains overtones. In fact, it contains only overtones. I've removed the fundamental frequency from the second note. So middle C does not exist in that sound. So how is it that both notes have the same pitch? The brain calculates the pitch that we perceive from the overtone series of a sound. Let's take a look at how that happens. There are two main theories about how the brain takes this cochlear output and turns it into pitch. The first, the spectral theory, is that the brain looks at this output and compares it against internal representations already present in the brain. For example, it would look at this and say, this pattern of overtones looks like a 200 hertz pattern we already know, so it must be 200 hertz. The temporal theory states that we process all the overtones of a sound into a simple condensed signal that has a period, which is the inverse of the frequency we perceive. So the brainstem takes this cochlear output and adjusting for lag time in a process called autocorrelation, calculates the simplified rate-based signal, which is sent to the auditory cortex. So the brain would see that this simplified resolve signal has a period of five milliseconds. Take the inverse and perceive it as 200 hertz. Both theories have support. Neither theory is perfect, but currently the theory with more evidence backing it is the temporal theory. The signal travels up the brainstem into the auditory cortex. Every stop along the way is tonotopically arranged. This means that all the nuclei the signal passes through, as well as the auditory cortex, process low frequency signals on one side and high frequency signals on the other. Once the signal reaches the auditory cortex, it's processed and turned into the perception of pitch that we are familiar with. It's believed that this may occur in an area of the auditory cortex called the universal pitch area. This is still being researched. Signal pitches are processed in the auditory cortex, but relationships between pitches are processed in other areas of the brain. The secondary auditory cortex, the area surrounding the primary auditory cortex, is responsible for early processing of intervals, melody, and harmony. Computation of pitch relations happens primarily in the right side of the brain. fMRI suggests processing of pitch chroma, the letter value of a note, in the anterior part of the temporal lobe, and pitch height in the posterior part. We see activation of inferior frontal regions with harmony and relative pitch processing, and the superior temporal gyri involved with consonants and dissonance. Contour, the general movement of pitch up and down, is processed primarily in the right hemisphere, while intervals are processed bilaterally. fMRI is not perfect, and we'll need years of further research and study before we are 100% sure how these regions are involved in each of these processes. We can, however, see that specific functions of pitch are localized and processed in separate, specific brain areas. Now we're going to take a look at absolute pitch, and this is just going to be a brief overview because I am going to do a separate video on absolute pitch alone. So absolute pitch is when someone can hear a note and instantly name it um, without any external reference. So it contains two sub-processes. The first is the ability to categorize that pitch, and the second is the ability to associate that pitch with the name of the pitch. So the first sub-process, categorization, is different in people with absolute pitch and people without it. A normal person like you or me, assuming you don't have absolute pitch, can differentiate six to seven different categories of pitch. You can tell the tone of a trombone from the tone of a trumpet. However, people with absolute pitch can have up to 70 different categories of pitch, meaning that they can differentiate very, very slight differences in pitch. 
Now, the second part of absolute pitch, the second sub process, is the labeling of that pitch that they've identified and the name of that pitch. For example, the key, G, A, B. And this is thought to occur in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is this area of your brain. In recent studies, it's been shown that that area is significantly overactive in musicians with absolute pitch compared to musicians without absolute pitch. And that area is also known for other associative factors. So it makes sense that it also controls the association between pitch and the name of the pitch. So you might have the question, can you learn absolute pitch? The short answer is not likely. Perfect pitch is thought to have a strong genetic factor and is strongly connected to early childhood musical training. And there's almost no cases of adults being able to learn perfect pitch. So on the other side of the coin, we have tone deafness. And tone deafness is scientifically defined as the inability to consciously discriminate tones that are less than one semitone apart. Let's find out if anyone in this room right now is tone deaf. I'm gonna give you guys all a tone deafness test. The tone deafness test has two parts, the higher lower portion and the sing it back portion. I'm gonna play you two notes and you let me know which note is higher. Here's the first set. First note, second note. Here's the second set. First note, second note. The right answer is that for the first set, the second note was higher, and for the second set, the first note was higher. If you had trouble with this, couldn't figure it out, you may have tone deafness. The second part of the tone deafness test is the sing it back portion. I'm gonna play the first set again, and this time, instead of telling me which one's higher and lower, just sing it back to me. Here we go. It turns out that people with tone deafness score significantly higher on the sing it back test than the higher lower test. Tone deaf people score an average of 50% on the higher lower test, meaning that they guess it right by chance. And interestingly, people with tone deafness score an average of 80% on the sing it back test. So even though they can't tell whether a note is higher or lower than another note, they can more accurately sing those notes when they hear it. Tone deafness also seems to be an isolated phenomenon and doesn't impact normal speech or function. Um, and an individual can live his or her entire life with no debilitations unless they're a musician. So how does it work? Tone deafness is thought to occur due to a deficiency in neural connections between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe on the right side of the brain. So on the left side of the brain, you have two areas. The first in your frontal lobe is known as Broca's area, and it's responsible for speech production. The second is known as Wernicke's area, and it's responsible for speech understanding. There's a white matter pathway that connects the two of these inside the brain called the arcuate fasciculus. That lets us understand what we're saying and produce it at roughly the same time. Now on the right side of the brain, you also have an arcuate fasciculus that connects these two areas. However, for people with tone deafness, um, it's been shown that there's a deficiency in the arcuate fasciculus, which can help explain why these people have issues um, identifying and producing pitch. So as an overview, pitch is a basic building block of sound that ranges from low frequency to high frequency and forms the basis of intervals, melody, harmony, and other musical features. It's initially processed as a series of electrical signals in the cochlea and in cranial nerve number eight, 
and then converted to a rate-based signal in the brainstem and perceived as pitch in the auditory cortex. Pitch is processed bilaterally on both sides of the brain, but certain functions of pitch are localized to the right hemisphere. Absolute pitch and tone deafness are special conditions related to pitch that show either an increased connectivity or a reduced connectivity in areas of the brain that are understood to have specific functions in regard to pitch.